If you read the literature, it's about 30 million amputees around the world. I think what motivates me is when I see the individuals that we actually do help. You know, it's that analogy of, you know, you can have all these starfish on the beach that are washed up and all of them are going to die. And you pick up the one starfish and you throw it back into the ocean. You know, you didn't save all the starfish, but the one starfish that you did pick up, you changed their life. Welcome to Crazy Good Turns. I'm your host, Frank Blake. We celebrate people who do amazingly good things for others. And today we're going to be talking to two people who exemplify what Crazy Good Turns is about. They are part of an organization, Limbs International, that's dedicated to providing affordable, high-quality prosthetics for amputees throughout the world. It's estimated that there are somewhere around 30 million, that's right, 30 million amputees throughout the developing world, and only 5% of them have access to any form of prosthetic device or assistance. We have on our show the founder of Limbs International, Roger Gonzalez, an engineering professor at the University of Texas, and a volunteer in the Limbs organization, Juan Acosta, who is also a physical therapist. By the way, Roger, the LIMS founder, was recently chosen as one of TIAA's Difference Maker 100 honorees. If you've been listening to this podcast recently, you've heard about TIAA's Difference Maker campaign. They're commemorating their centennial by celebrating people who've inspired others and have made a positive impact on the world. On October 1st, TIAA announced... 100 Difference Makers, with a $10,000 donation in their name to support the nonprofit where they make a difference. That's 100 donations totaling $1 million. They also held a company-wide 100 Days of Difference campaign through which TIAA employees participated in 341 projects, touching close to 700,000 lives across the country. If you want to learn more about this, visit their website at TIAA.org. I think you're going to really enjoy this podcast. I know that when I started to learn about limbs, at the beginning I had no idea of the extent of the issue around amputees worldwide and what an important and yet also really difficult problem it is to solve. I hope you enjoy this podcast. Thanks. So now uh, it's my honor and privilege to introduce Roger Gonzalez, the founder of Limbs International. And we have Juan Acosta, who's a physical therapist and also a Limbs volunteer, also on the line for this podcast. And Roger, where I'd like to start is where did the idea for Limbs International come from? The organization's been in existence since 2004, is that correct? That's correct. Uh, Next year, we'll be celebrating our 15th uh, anniversary. And, you know, it's first started as really a student project for a capstone engineering course where I was teaching. And I had been a professor for, at that point, about 10 years. And I had kind of been through getting tenure and getting all the things that need to get started in a successful academic career. And I realized that I had always had this hope to be able to help the poorest of the poor somewhere in the world with being able to walk again from an experience that I had growing up. And so at that point, I kind of handpicked four students and said, let's choose a challenging problem and go after it and see what we can come up with. And that's kind of the inception of how it started, really as a concept back in 2003 until we started our efforts in 2004. And what was your experience earlier in your life? that led you to look at this? I grew up here in El Paso, Texas. It's a binational border region. Many times in growing up, uh, my father and I used to cross the border to do various errands and uh, shopping and stuff. And in one of those trips in downtown Juarez, Mexico, I ran into a situation where there was a little uh, boy about my age, 10 to 12 years old, and he had had some deformities in his lower legs and it was sitting in a cart and pushing himself along trying to play with the rest of the kids. And I looked at him and I, you know, I thought, you know, if it, uh, he's just my age and I'm able to run and to walk and he's able to just sit there and try to be part of his own community. And it really uh, impacted me in such a way that I thought, 
mm-hmm. by, the, by the grace of God, that be, you know, me sitting there instead of him. And so that was really the inception of me having more of a, of a heart for those who are disabled around the world. And as I matured over the time, that, that experience never left me. And as I became a professor and I had resources of a research lab and, you know, talented students, I thought, you know, this is a good time to try to, you know, go after trying to, you know, contribute in my small way back to helping those without mobility regain that. In the introduction, Roger, I was talking about the number of people that, you know, the number of amputees across the world. And it's a stunning number and the very limited access that they have to prosthetics. Did you know that at the start of this or is that something that you learned along the way? You know, I, I knew there was a need. I had traveled the world before, and I knew that people that were amputees had problems getting the resources that they needed to uh, regain mobility. So I kind of had an experiential knowledge of it. I didn't realize the magnitude of that problem until I really got into the details. And and now that I've you know been doing this for 15 years, you know, I kind of understand the reason for the challenges that exist around the world, especially if you're very poor in a in an underdeveloped country understanding the challenges that is left there. So I guess I would say I had kind of a limited understanding at that point, but not to the scope that I have come to understand it at this point. So when and why did this senior engineering project turn into an organization devoted to helping others? Yeah, as we started to grow and started, you know, we're doing a lot of work in Africa, expanded to Southeast Asia and Bangladesh, we realized that we were spending more and more time helping people and and dealing with organizational issues such as being effective in what we're trying to do. And working in the context of a university is great. You know, educational institutions are really good at providing education, but they're not really good NGOs. And we realized that to be more effective in our mission, we really need to be, we needed to be free to make some decisions to be more effective, to be able to not expose necessarily university to uh, undue risk and to really absorb it as ourselves to be able to take ownership for our decisions. So when we started to see some success around the world, we realized that we needed to essentially become independent as a, a 501c3 here and operate like other NGOs around the world. But do you still have students who help out and work on the projects? Yes, we absolutely do. We have students all the way. Uh, we've had, uh, you know, sometimes junior high students, sometimes high school students. We have college students here at the University of Texas at El Paso at UTEP, all the way from undergraduate to master's students. And we even have a doctoral candidate that is working on a research project for us for his PhD. So we still have students highly involved in what we do. And I bet this has an amazing impact on them as well. Is that right? Yes. In fact, a lot of the students that have worked with us over the years, it has really changed the direction of their own professional careers. Some of them becoming prosthetists, some of them going to physical therapy school, some of them pursuing advanced degrees in in biomedical engineering. So it has a tremendous effect to the experience that they have with us and, and the way they view the world, the way they view the disabled and what they want to do with their own professional career. You know, not being an engineer myself, I'm thinking these are complex projects. How, how complicated is doing a knee joint or a lower limb? I'm an engineer, so uh, many of the things, I have a high-end research lab where we look at actually human knee joints. So I would say the complexity of our work is really not so much in the design as much as in the issues regarding how do you make that design cost-effective and durable in the environments that they're going to operate in. So the challenge isn't so much in what is the design of the mechanism. The challenge is in how do you make it affordable? How do you make it uh, durable? How do you make it uh, sustainable across the developing world? It's not like we're coming up with totally new technologies. We do a lot of work where we adopt existing technologies and then redefine them and readjust them to making them uh, accessible to the rest of the world. And so that's a good entry point to what you found over the last almost 15 years in terms of what are the issues you have to overcome, how you make progress in this area, what have your discoveries been? Early on in getting into this, we realized that one of the challenges was uh, how do you create a low-cost device that is durable? I think there's devices out there that exist that are low-cost, but they have significant limitations on durability. And by durable, lasting 
how long? We designed our, our devices for a patient that walks 10 to 15 kilometers a day and that we wanted to have a durability of anywhere from five to seven or eight years or longer. And so we really targeted amputees that were at the younger stages of life that really had lost mobility and it was impacting their own livelihood so that they needed to walk again so they could you know, gain employment and be back in society. So that's what I mean by durability in the sense that you're not having to produce, um, you're not having to maintain the device on a you know, semi-regular basis for it to be durable. And so that requires the implementation of technologies that say, okay, how am I going to deal with environments that uh, have a lot of dirt, a lot of water, don't have to be you know, kept very clean, that have the ability to uh, endure impact, you know, being dropped and stuff. So all those things become factors in how we design our devices. And over time, we have learned that certain things work really well and some things you know, could work better than others. And so we have refined our design over 15 years. We're soon releasing our latest uh, model that actually has better performance and lower cost. So we keep, you know, it's really interesting because we keep making devices that have uh, better durability and still reducing the cost more and more. And that's always something we're working on. So that's one of the issues that we ran into is is this issue of durability. The the other issue, believe it or not, that's been a huge challenge is the issue of distribution around the world. Believe it or not, many times taking products across countries, you know, sovereign countries is difficult because of customs. And in that context, we need to work sometimes with our partners at that clinic to make sure we can get it across without any uh, duties, uh, costs imposed on it. Uh, we have to work with organizations such as Rotary International in some places to get across. So distribution across uh, sovereign countries has been incredibly challenging. And it, it's almost proportional to typically the the more underdeveloped countries, the harder we have to work at it because of the restrictions they have in bringing in products. So that's been a big issue. Another challenge has been that we can get the hardware there, but at the end of the day, you still need a prosthetist to create the socket. And those skill sets are not highly available, especially in the parts of the world that we work in. So we try to, you know, find the best mechanism by way to help patients get fitted. And then, you know, over the last probably seven or eight years, we've realized that even if, let's say, we get the device to you, it's durable, we find a prosthetist to fit you, at the end of the day, you still need rehabilitation. And that rehabilitation is probably the key factor in your being able to truly regain mobility. And rehabilitation and developing world is almost a non-existent uh, discipline. And so we've had to introduce the concepts of rehabilitation for amputees at at various levels and working with our partners around the world. And that's where people like Juan, that's a volunteer with us, and other prosthetists really impact the work that we do. Because we realize that if I can produce the best piece of hardware, I can get it to you, I can get you fitted. But if I don't teach you how to walk again and teach you some basic principles of rehabilitation, really the long-term impact of what we do is going to be severely limited. So that's a great intro to asking Juan about, Juan, how did you begin working with Limbs International? Roger and I have a long history. We were both students here at UTEP 30, over 35 years ago. Our lives took different paths. He became an engineer. I became a physical therapist. I've always admired his work from afar. Over the last few years, I have become involved with LIMS as a volunteer. I've had the privilege of uh, traveling with LIMS to San Salvador, El Salvador, and to Ciudad de Mexico in Mexico, where my contribution to LIMS have, has been in providing rehabilitation at the ground level. We have a rehabilitation program that was designed by uh, a school associated with Harvard, and we have a, a manual, and we have a, a program that we provide to the community that goes along with our, with our hardware. So you must see at the ground level how being an amputee, how that affects people, and particularly the impact in developing countries. How would you describe that? One of the things that LIMS has spearheaded recently is the, the concept of community-based rehabilitation. So setting up community-based rehab centers, once we provide them with the prosthetic, then we have to train them and family members. Hopefully, they'll have access to some local therapists 
whether they do or not, our job is to train them to become their own therapists. Recently, we, I, I took a trip to Ciudad de Mexico in Mexico. We donated and we gave them uh, rehab equipment, including things like parallel bars, stairs, mats, weights, elastic tubings, and we provided a, a week-long uh, training workshop on lower limb amputations and how they can Im- integrate their, their uh, hardware. I've seen up close and personal how this has impacted individuals once they receive the, the, the limb. I've always believed that as a physical therapist, half the job is motivation, if not more. And these individuals are very grateful. <clears throat> they have an incredible amount of motivation. Actually, I've seen that a great amount of success in them returning and utilizing their prosthesis. So, Roger, how many countries does LIMS serve? You know, that's a good question. Over the last 15 years, the way we count, if we count to the countries where our hardware has been used, we're sitting at about 52 countries in the world. Now, it doesn't mean that we're doing community-based rehab in all those countries. I think it flows from different areas and times of what we're doing. Uh, So in some countries, we're highly involved, like in Latin America, where we go in sometimes on a biannual basis, uh, sorry, semi-annual basis to do some training. And then there's other countries where we just send hardware because they already have an existing program. So it varies depending on how you look at it. But if you look at countries that have used our hardware throughout our 15 years, it's about 52 countries. And how many people would you say you've helped over the period of time? You know, I get that question all the time. That's a difficult number because early on in our history, uh, we developed a means by which to locally manufacture our devices. We call them maker kits. And so what we did is we distributed about maybe two dozen maker kits around the world. And so people took those maker kits and then we were able to create our hardware to fit people. So we don't have complete counts. But our best estimate is that we're in the several thousands of people. You know, I would have to guess 3,000, 4, maybe 5,000 people over the last 15 years. And when you look at the enormity of the need, and I mean, it is, it is so important, I think, to not let that paralyze you. You know, you do for one and you then do for 10 and 100 and 1,000. What keeps you going? What keeps you motivated on this? The numbers, if you read the literature, it's about 30 million amputees around the world. And so, you know, even at the scale of 5,000, we've still done a a small percentage. I think what motivates me is when I see the individuals that we actually do help. It's that analogy of, you know, you can have all these starfish on the beach that are washed up and all of them are going to die. And you pick up the one starfish and you throw it back into the ocean. You know, you didn't save all the starfish, but the one starfish that you did pick up, you changed their life. And so what keeps me motivated is that, well, I may not be able to help a huge percentage of the 30 million. I know the people that we can help, we have significantly changed their life. So it's, in my sense, it's a small part contributing to the global efforts that are happening everywhere around the world of what we're all trying to do. So in some sense, we're just trying to do our part to the extent that we can. One of the challenges that uh, we do face is we're limited in how many people we can help because of the limited you know, resources that we can acquire. Some of those resources are volunteers and giving us some of their services from like Juan giving physical therapy and other people providing their resources for like helping us with different administrative duties. You know, we're an organization, we're a business in the sense that we still need things like accountants and attorneys for things that we deal with. But I think one of the biggest issues, like any other nonprofit, is we are dependent upon donations of individuals because uh, it takes money to do certain things. And so probably the biggest factor in how many people we can help is uh, our, our funding base to be able to grow that. Was it a surprise to you as you embarked on this, how much time you have to spend on the fundraising? And do you have an observation on that? I've never taken a penny as a salary. Fortunately, I have the privilege of being a faculty member with a lot of flexibility on my time. I'll tell you one thing. In fact, Juan and I were talking this morning that one of the biggest challenges that LIMS has faced is the issue of fundraising and the amount of time and effort it takes to do that well. And one of the things they never teach you in engineering school is how to fundraise. They don't teach you that anywhere, I don't think. 
I've had to spend a lot of time reading books and listening to seminars, and it's still something I'm working on. It's one of those necessary evils in running a nonprofit, and uh, it takes a lot of effort and time and energy to build the relationships and then help people understand you know, how their contributions contribute to the overall effort in helping change other people's lives. So, yes, it's something I didn't realize I was going to have to get into, and it's one of those things that I've had to learn. And is there someone's advice that's been useful in this process for you, someone who's, you know, whether from a business or fundraising or just more general perspective, whose words have been meaningful to you? I've, you know, run into different people that do this for a living for other organizations. And, and one of the things I've always appreciated about them is that fundraising is about being able to interact with people. Right. It's, it's very much a people-oriented initiative. In other words, talking to people, helping them become educated in your passions, help them to understand what difference a donation can make. Those things are really important. You know, I, I hate to say this, but I'm a good engineer and I know how to deal with technology and I know how to be able to deal with equations. And uh, it's not, you know, those are one of the things that, that engineers are obviously sometimes looked down upon in the fact that they don't tend to be, you know, highly people oriented. And that's something that we spend so much time learning technology and science and mathematics that we kind of forget the personal side of life. And, and that's one of the things that drew, drew me to this is I wanted to make a difference personally. And so my challenge has been to how do I communicate the need and the passion and, and the drive that I have to help others to those who maybe not, can't do it full time, but they can certainly play a part either with their donations or with their own time and professional you know, skills. And is there a personal story that you tell or that crystallizes it for you, someone whom you've helped? You say, this is what LIMS is about? Yeah, I, I have two different stories. Uh, one story is an early experience I had when I first got into LIMS International when I was in Bangladesh, probably the second or third year of the organization. One of the patients was named Nubir. Nubir speaks Bengali. I don't speak a word in Bengali. And so I went to Bangladesh, and he was, at that time, highly skeptical of, of Americans. What are they doing in our country? You know, what are they trying to get from us? And uh, he was an amputee. He had lost his leg in an accident. And so we had a chance to work with a clinic in Bangladesh, and, and we got a chance to fit him. And his countenance over time, over the three or four subsequent visits that I made back to Bangladesh, his countenance changed from being skeptical and kind of distant and aloof to really embracing me as an individual. I remember in my last visit when I went to back to Bangladesh, when I got off the van in the little village that he lived in, him running to me with his prosthetic, with his arms open wide to give me a hug. You know, running to me, he had, hadn't been able to run before with his arms open wide. We probably, I probably spoke two words of Bengali. We didn't say a lot, but we gave each other a big embrace. He ended up changing his life. In other words, today, or, or the last time I saw him, he was you know, out walking around, flagging down buses, because what happens in Bangladesh, if you're a person with means, you sit on a bench and let someone else flag a bus down for you, so you're not standing on the edge of the road. And what those people do is they give a tip to the people who flag the bus down. And so Nubir, was, that's what he was doing. He was out running around on his prosthetic on the streets, flagging down buses to live on tips. And uh, eventually, I think he did get a job and, and, uh, that was more sustainable. But those images you know, struck me of what's happened with Nubir over time. The second one is actually a very recent experience I had. I was in, um, in Cuernavaca, and uh, that's in Mexico, uh, a city outside of Mexico City. And um, I ran into an older man in his 50s that had had a double amputation above his knees, uh, lost both legs to complications of diabetes. You know, we typically don't recommend to fit a double amputee because it's just very difficult, no matter what kind of technology. Even if you have U.S. high technology, it's very difficult to walk again. So I knew that he probably would never be able to walk unassisted in any way again. But they had fit him. And uh, so I showed up uh, to uh, the city and, and I met him. When I walked up, he stood up from his wheelchair on both his legs 
and uh, the prosthetics that we gave him. And I, I remember looking at him saying, you know, thinking in my mind, this man will never walk unassisted again. It's just not going to happen. But yet he just beamed with confidence again, saying that he had been given dignity again because he could stand up and look at me mm. face to face. With a sense of pride and dignity, he stood up on those two prosthetic legs and just told me, thank you for giving me dignity again. That really did impact me. Wow. And I, I, I would bet that's a common theme, the giving dignity to people who are in such uh, tough circumstances. Juan, do you have sort of similar? The one that impacts me the most is um, three years ago, I met an individual in El Salvador, and he was an above-knee amputee. We uh, fitted him with his uh, prosthesis, and I had a total of three sessions with him. After giving the class on the rehabilitation manual that LIMS has put together, I had some one-on-one time with him. And now, mind you, I've been a physical therapist for 32 years, and it's hard to have an above knee amputee walk immediately. Yet this man had so much motivation that within those few sessions that he had, he was able to master uh, his prosthesis and, and move on to a cane. Shortly after that, he would send me short video clips. And he would show me videos of him going up and down stairs, <laughs> videos of him climbing a ladder to the roof. You know, he still stays in touch with me. He's working. He's uh, helping sustain his family. By the way, his name was uh, Miguel. The other story is uh, a young man named Samuel in Mexico City. He also lost his limb due to diabetes. He had a, a complicated wound. Him being an above-knee amputee, he's gone through two prostheses, works full-time, sustains his family, is very active in the community, and he is very active in encouraging other amputees. He works with an organization there locally in Mexico City that we have partnered up with. And they look for individuals who've had recent amputations, and they'll visit them in the hospitals, and they'll tell them, look, there is hope. You will walk again. By the way, we have this organization that partners up with us, and, and we'll help you get a prosthesis. So these stories are are very encouraging to me uh, as a physical therapist that uh, I can provide uh, some hope to somebody you know, right next to, to our country, and uh, knowing that LIMS has a, an international impact is very encouraging. Those are amazing, amazing stories. One other thing that I'd like to touch on is, Roger, you were chosen one of TIA's Difference Maker 100 honorees. I guess this goes into the fundraising category. How did you, how did you think of applying? How did that process work? And congratulations to you. Thank you. You know, I was on TIA Kreft's uh, website because they're the ones who do the, you know, they're one of the organizations that manages, you know, the retirement portfolios for university professors. And I was on the site and I, and I saw this uh, difference maker thing and I just kind of kind of thought, oh, that's, re- that's really nice. It came up in one of our staff meetings and stuff and our, uh, one of our um, volunteers that helps do some grant writing for us. Uh, said to me, hey, you know, I think you should uh, let me nominate you for this. And I said, you know, I appreciate that, but, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of great things done by many people around the world, and just, we're just one of those points of light. And she goes, no, I really do think you should let me do that because, you know, obviously our faculty member, and, you know, I, I think you have a great story because you're... And so I said, sure, if you'd like to do that. So she went ahead and nominated me, and, and that's how it came to be. Congratulations. And where is LIMS poised to go for the future? You know, one of the challenges, as, as I mentioned earlier, is we've realized that rehabilitation is such a key portion of regaining mobility and dignity again. And it's a need that in underdeveloped countries, like I said, is highly non-existent. We don't run into many physical therapy professionals around the world. So our future really is to say, okay, let's continue to improve our technologies and, and continue to do, meet those needs, but to use that technology as a, as a point of leverage where we can really say, let's expand our influence to helping people gain the rehabilitation help that they need. And so we look at rehabilitation very holistically. We don't just look at it as the ability for you to regain physical mobility because many people who are amputated suffer from uh, depression. They suffer from a lack of 
motivation in the sense that, you know, what am I going to do now because I can't walk? What am I going to do now because I can't get a job? What am I going to do now because I can't provide for a family? Especially if you're young and you think, how am I going to provide? You know, these countries don't have the social uh, network or the the help uh, governmental help that we see in the United States, so they're really in a very difficult difficult place. We're working alongside various partners around the world to address rehabilitation, not just by hey, here's how you can walk better, but helping them understand that the the struggles that they face both emotionally and other factors that relate to their own well-being can be addressed also. You know, we're not there. We come in and do some work. We do training. So we are very, very focused on finding uh, local partners in these places of the world to help them understand, let me help you help others. Yeah, You know, we're not trying to create professional prosthetists and know everything about physical rehabilitation. We're not trying to create, you know, professional counselors, but we're trying to empower the local community to be more effective at being able to do what these local communities have the ability to do. And that's why we call it a lot about, we use the term CBR, community-based rehabilitation. That really is the future of where we're going. And, you know, you've heard the axiom, Give a man a fish and feed him for a day. Teach him to fish and feed him for a lifetime. You know, we're really working hard at teaching people how to fish so that long after we're gone, they keep giving back to their community. And that's a slow process. That's why we've, over 15 years, that's why we have not been able to do tens of thousands. We've been able to do just a few thousands because we spend our time focusing on what's a long-term effect. You know, at some point, you know, I'm going to move on and, and maybe limbs, depending on what happens with limbs, you know, it may continue or may move on. But I feel that what we've done as an organization will keep giving back long after our lifetime process has been played out. Roger, what, a, what an amazing story. And thank you so much for sharing it. I, this is a truly a crazy good turn that started from something you saw as a child and then a student project and into something that has helped thousands and and brought attention to to a really major major issue and Juan thanks very much for your work and what you do with limbs and the impact you're making this is uh, truly inspirational appreciate very much your participating and I hope that the people who are listening to this podcast and who are moved by uh, what you've talked about will take a look at your site limbs.org and check out your website and check out what Roger you and your team do because it's really impressive.